Welcome back to another Keystone Dental Group Vanguard webinar. My name is Michael Marnick, Director of Marketing for Keystone Dental. And as we continue in our pursuit of ongoing learning, today's webinar is with our very own CTO and Medical Director of the Keystone Dental Group, Dr. Michael Klein. The title, Creating Predictable Outcomes, Optimizing the Bone and Soft Tissue Response at the Implant Abutment Interface. In today's webinar with Dr. Klein, we will learn about proper subgingival abutment design, the impact of surface contaminants on sterile implants, as well as possibilities for improving bone around implant restorations over time. Dr. Klein graduated from the University of Maryland Dental School. He then went on to complete a GPR program at Woodhull Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. Dr. Klein received his training in oral implantology by completing a two-year full-time fellowship in oral implantology and biomaterials at the Brookdale Hospital Medical Center in Brooklyn, New York. He then completed his specialty training in prosthodontics at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey. Dr. Klein is a diplomat of the American Board of Oral Implantology. He has pioneered technology used in computer guidance for dental implant surgery and holds multiple patents. Dr. Klein founded Implant Logic Systems, a commercial leader in the development of technology, software, and hardware for computer guided dental implant surgical procedures. And with this, all the way from Israel, I'd like to give you a warm welcome to my friend and colleague, Dr. Michael Klein. I am Dr. Michael Klein, the CTO and Medical Director of Keystone Dental, Altop Advanced Dental Solutions. Now, before we get to our topic of the day, I would kind of be remiss if I didn't say something about uh, COVID-19 in our current situation. So for those of you, uh, some of you may know me, some of you may not. I'm a, as well as uh, being the involved with Keystone and Peltop, I am a practicing prosthodontist. And my office is in Long Island, New York, but my home is in Israel. So uh, I have something of a long commute and COVID has put some, uh, something of a little bit of a kink in my ability to go ahead and travel. Now, Israel is a beautiful place. Uh, it's a combination of uh, the very old thousands of years, as well as having a young and vibrant society and beautiful land. I live in a kind of interesting place from my home. If I look to the west, I can see Jerusalem, you see on the mountaintops. When I look to the east, Look at the Far East there. I'm looking at uh, Amman, Jordan. So I live in a uh, very uh, interesting and active place in the, in the world. Now, about two months ago, when the lockdown started, so it gave me an opportunity to spend a little more time around my house with my wife you know, and with my daughter. Very quickly, um, within a few days, we went from uh, walking freely outside to being in, in masks and gloves. My daughter, who normally at this time would be in her apartment with her friends at university uh, in Tel Aviv, is home, uh, uh, you know, vegging out on the on the couch, playing on our playing on our phone. Now, my grandchildren seem to like it at first, right? And they seem to be doing well. And as time went on, some of them thrived on it because their parents were home, and some of them were a little concerned about what was uh, what was going on. Had to be a little innovative and exercise when all of a sudden we couldn't leave our houses. So I turned my hot tub into a an endless pool. We blamed everything on coronavirus. Got a little uh, ridiculous at times. Life events. We've been again two months. Life events and life cycles have happened throughout this time. But I can tell you now that we're coming out of it and we're beginning to adapt to the new reality, understanding a little bit more how to go out in society and do the things that we normally go ahead and do. Here, the children are going back to school, we can get outside for activities. We're learning how to have you know, family gatherings with social distancing. Now, along with that, we also have concerns how are we going to go and get back to work? And I have the same concerns that you do. And I've been investigating and looking at all different types of alternatives. And each of us obviously wants to uh, provide a safe environment, both for ourselves, our staff, our patients. And so we really need to do our investigations. Are all these things that are being promoted, are they effective? Are they realistic? 
how do we go about being able to provide the care that we're normally used to and want to provide for our patients? How do we go about doing that? And that's going to be, I think, a little bit of a journey for us. But, uh, you know, it's coming quick because we're getting back to our offices. Now, some of us have taken another alternative how to manage the current situation. So I'm not an advocate of lots of alcohol, but because most of you are probably at home, you know, watching this lecture. So I welcome you open up a bottle of wine, you now take your favorite drink, and you can sit back and relax and enjoy the rest of the presentation. Now, my topic that I picked was discussing, you know, how do we optimize bone and soft tissue at the implant abutment interface. And that topic is something you can talk about for a day or days. I'm going to come about it because I only have around 45 minutes or so from a little bit of a different orientation than probably most of you are, are, are used to looking at it. And so I ask you to just take it into consideration and, and put some of these thoughts into your thinking processes as you plan and implement treatment for your patients. So this is a, a favorite type of patient of mine. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not sure if you can guess why looking at it, you might think, well, why it's, you know, it's in the aesthetic zone. Um, you know, there are adjacent restorations. But if you take a look at the x-ray, what you'll notice is, is that there is a previous implant that's been placed. I've placed this implant. As a matter of fact, this patient came to my office several years before, and she looked exactly like she looked now, but with a contralateral tooth. Now she's coming with tooth number eight missing, and she came looking exactly the same way with tooth number nine missing. And so why is this my favorite patient? Because I'm going to implement and recommend the same exact treatment that I recommended for this patient several years before. And the patient knows this. So we're going to extract the tooth. We're going to immediately place the implant. We're going to immediately provisionalize this tooth. And we're going to do a connective tissue graft simultaneously. And so the patient already knows what the treatment is. The patient knows what it's going to cost to have this done and just wants to get started with treatment. So that's why I like this patient. This is an easy patient to go ahead and, and, uh, and begin treatment with. So let's go quickly through the treatment process. We take bone beam CT, as we do with all our cases. We take an oral uh, surface scan. We have a virtual wax up done, which is basically just creating a mirror image of the adjacent tooth. And then it's all put together. So we're seeing the cross-section of the cone beam CT, and in the same cross-section, we're seeing the soft tissue profile as it exists in the patient right now, along with a profile image of the virtual wax up, which is a mirror image of the contralateral tooth, and the implant placement can now be organized properly. How do we do that? Well, you know, I try to do everything as objectively and scientifically as possible. So we have a lot of data in the literature. So we're going to take our evidence-based measurements, right, to create a, a optimal implant position because there is an optimal position for any given patient. So we know that from a, in a vertical orientation, we place the implant three to four millimeters apical to where we want or anticipate developing buckle-free gingival margin. And that comes directly from the literature. It's been well established. You've all heard it many, many, many times. I've just cited one article here from uh, Salama and Garber and Darnell, okay? Very well known. We also know there's going to be some horizontal bone resorption, regardless of whether you graft a socket or you don't graft a socket or what type of material you use. Alloplast, autogenous bone, xenograft, um, it, doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really matter. We have to anticipate there's going to be some resorption. And so we position the implant two millimeters palatal, but two millimeters to the lingual number one anticipation of absorption and number two we want to have a volume usually of try and have two millimeters of bone to the buckle of that implant number three we know that we're going to have some we need to anticipate to have some vertical resorption right of the buckle um uh, crestal alveolar bone maybe a half millimeter to a millimeter so we're going to position our implant in that position so we can come up with an evidence-based comprehensive treatment plan or positioning, you know, for the ideal position for this particular given instance. And we take all of that and we create tools it's for the time of surgery. And what are the tools? Here, it's going to be a surgical guide so that we can exactly position the implant in the position that we developed, along with a provisional restoration. Now, the provisional restoration is created from the STL or manufacturing file that comes from the data of the virtual wax up, which is a mirror image of the adjacent tooth in that area. 
Now, today, I might implement that treatment in the area of COVID differently, just to show you how at least I'm currently thinking. Now, we haven't implemented this yet at this point in time, but how I would manage a patient like this. And so we're talking about and discussing with my partner, Dr. Alon Woltok, you know, potentially doing, um, you know, uh, online or virtual consultations, whether it's in Zoom or looking for a, a HIPAA compliant type of medium to go ahead and, and, and conduct an online consultation, we can at least anticipate the patient is going to come in. Because now what I can do is have that patient come in for that first visit. They go directly into the treatment operatory. We can do a clinical examination, take whatever radiographs are made. At that same visit, we can take our own beam CT scan. At that same visit, we take our enteral surface scan. We can then either ourselves, as we would do it in our office, or if you don't have that capability, you could immediately send the data out to a planning service that can immediately, probably in 10, 15 minutes, create a plan for you that you can then verify while the patient is sitting in that operatory. Because in, in thinking about how to manage and treat patients in the age of COVID, one of the biggest challenges is the, is the, is the, transferring of patients, going from, you know, bringing a patient in, now how do you go and you do you manage that operatory, the air in the operatory, the protective equipment everybody is going ahead and, and wearing. And so the fewer times I can have that patient have to come to my office, I know the better off I'm going to be. I'm going to be able to manage their treatment better. Patients are going to feel safer, less possibility of transmission of disease if there are fewer encounters inside that office. So I can keep that patient in that treatment room, right? Because I've taken these two data sets. The laboratory can go ahead and create the plan, or we can create the plan. In the office, we have a 3D printer and a milling machine. They send the plan back. We mill the provisional. We print the the surgical guide all while the patient is sitting in the treatment room and hasn't yet left the office and at that same time the treatment room can be set up for the procedure and the patient can be anesthetized and so there's really very little lost time in terms of that it's actually it's going to be save time and the patient doesn't have to come in for another treatment encounter so one simple example of how thinking in terms of implementing treatment in the age of covid might be different Okay, now we might start to think of how can we maximize the patient encounter, right, and minimize the number of times the patient has to return to the, to the office for treatment. So we go and we extract the tooth. Here I'm using a tool called Benex to vertically extract the tooth. Of course, we could have removed this tooth, you know, relatively simply with a, with a forceps. However, I'm trying to minimize, minimize, you know, the luxation of that tooth because I want to prevent and again minimize the microfractures that will occur from that luxation to the buccal cortical plate. The more microfractures I have, and potentially more horizontal resorption of that buccal plate I'm going to go ahead and have. If I vertically extract the tooth, seat the surgical guide, prepare the osteotomy, implant will be placed. This is a Paltop advanced implant. There you see the implant position, and there's space between the buccal plate. And the implant, remember I positioned it two millimeters to the, the bowel, and that's grafted with a xenograft. I like to use a material that's probably non-resorbable in that space. And I try to do things as objectively as I possibly can. And so I want to assess the stability of that implant before I make the final decision to immediately provisionalize the implant. And so we take ISQ measurements. right? I know from the literature that if I have measurements of 70 or above, it's relatively safe. Now, it's not exactly, exactly true that I can automatically immediately provisionalize with a number of 70. We have to assess the our functional habits of the patients. We have to assess the occlusion. If I had a number of 70 and the patient had a relatively deep bite, I might still be concerned. So there's lots of other factors. Are there teeth on either side? Um, is this, uh, are there multiple implants being splinted? Is it coming around the arch? This is another factor or the tool I have and help make that assessment what's appropriate. Now, in order for me to particularly get numbers that are high enough to do this immediately provisionalization, I need to use an implant that has a geometric design or external geometric design that will provide me with adequate initial stability because that's what gives the initial stability. It's the outside geometry of the, of the implant. So I, as I said before, I place the top implant here. And in my assessment of, is this a good geometry, right? I did an initial study in my office of the first 281 Paltop advanced implants that I placed. I took 562. 
measurements or two measurements on each uh, on each implant. I include with it in this all my data. So it's all my implant sizes at that time, three to five through five millimeters and from eight millimeters through 16 millimeters. I didn't exclude any patients. It had no bearing whether the patient was diabetic or a smoker or a long-term steroid usage or bisphosphonate user because I'm assessing initial stability. But I did include all the things that might impact it on it, extraction, medium implant placement, placement of the sinus grafts, everything that fell into that range. My overall range of ISQ values was 4390. Again, I'm placing some in, in some graphs, some in anterior mantle that's very dense. But my average ISQ value was 73.5. So above the 70 number, so I know good external geometric design and thread pattern to gain good stability for immediate provisionalization. Now, the question that most people would ask me after I showed that was, well, but what happens after the implant heals? So I looked at another 43 patients, right? I took 100 measurements, 100, excuse me, 100 implants, 400 measurements, which were two measurements at the time a day of placement, two at the time of restoration. That's why it's between one and a half months and six months, because that's the healing time prior to restoration. And the numbers at placement were 71, 73, again, falling in line with more the previous data that I had showed you. And after that healing period, I'm at 74, 75. So I'm maintaining that good stability. I maintain I have good healing around the surface of the of the implant because number of 70 or plus are, are very good numbers to have in highest values. Now we've made the decision to immediately provisionalize the implant, and so we take our peak abutment. I like to use acrylic to reline my provisional, and because the acrylic is not going to stick to peak, I go ahead and I create some mechanical retention in, and I just cut a cut, took a round burr in my high speed and uh, cut a couple of holes inside the inside the peak. Now I go and I take my provisional that's been machined, okay, from a manufacturing file that exactly replicates the contralateral tooth, right? That was my mirror image. Here I see it seated into place. Again, it's designed with a hole that will exactly accommodate the position of that peak abutment, and we know that because it's done with the surgical guide and the surgical guide position. Now, in this peak component, there's a concave element, and if we look through all the components in the PALTOP system, whether it's the healing abutment or the impression copings or the provisional components or final prefabricated abutments, a concave design is implemented in that. And we're going to talk later on the significance uh, of the concave design and, and why um, it may be important to have in your design of your restorations. Now we're going to go ahead and do a subepithelial connected tissue graft. And I routinely do this in aesthetic cases. And that's because I just found over time, although the, the soft tissue will heal and remain healthy, over time, we end up with some resorption of that buccal cortical plate and some flattening of that area. So even though it may look good on initial placement of the restoration, and for the first several months, when you look down the road at two years, three years, four years, a certain segment of those cases are going to look flat. So I automatically do this procedure. I adopted a procedure I learned from Homozana from UCLA, where I create a vertical vestibular incision and I tunnel up underneath the supergingival complex to kind of place my graft, as opposed to creating a pocket at the crest and trying to stuff in the soft tissue and then having a pop out one side and you fight with it and, and all those other, you know, uh, all those other issues. So it's really quick and predictable to go ahead and create this tunnel as long as you have some good tunneling instruments. I lasso the connective tissue and then I pull it up through the tunnel into position underneath that uh, the whole gingival complex. Now I take my provisional restoration, I seat it into place and I take the two straight sutures, right, they're actually the, the end of each uh, of that suture, and I pull the connective tissue into the concave neck of my restoration. So I pull it into position, and then I tie the suture around the powell to fix it into place. And that's it, so no complex suturing to go ahead and do. I just put the connective tissue through the tunnel, I pull it into position into the neck, of that concave design of the restoration and tie it off along the pallel and then just put several small suture interrupted sutures to close my vestibular incision and this is how the patient walks out the walks out the door now i take a look at the patient four months later and let's evaluate and compare it to where we started so if i look at and compare the free gingival margin positions i see that i have a neck gain of tissue well that's great okay i look at the at the volume from a buccal pallel orientation from where it was when the initial implant was initially placed. This is pre-placing the, the 
gingival, the uh, connective tissue graft, and predictably of a large volume of healthy soft tissue, stable soft tissue around the, around the implant. And I look, and I'm pretty happy with the result. And the patient's pretty happy with the result. Restoration was made by an excellent local restorative doctor, Dr. Kasavikas. Um, and yet, as I look at it, and I start to be more critical, I say, well, one of these restorations looks better than the other. One restoration looks better than the other, although the, the nice restorations. Now, I performed the surgical procedure on both of these implants. And the same restorative doctor went ahead and restored both these implants. And it was the same procedures that we use both in surgery and restoration to do that. So what is it? Why does one look a little better than the other? And, and I'll remind you what the patient looked like before we started. So you'll see, you know, we, we retain the same gingival architecture and shape, you know, from before the surgery till after the surgery. And so only if I can analyze this and break down the differences, can I potentially identify what is the critical factor that makes the difference? And only if I can do that, can I predictably repeat the better result? So if I look at what I will call the pseudo papilla, one, looks better than the other. If I look at that, the pharyngeal margin, one looks better than the other. And this was not created or done through any type of gingival, you know, uh, mechanical shaping, laser, scalpel, just by the shape of the restoration. I look at the bone levels. Well, they're both doing pretty well. But I see that the difference is a difference in what I will call the transgingival segment. From the implant connection up to the pharyngeal margin, you see we're having a difference in shape and concept of design between the older restoration and the newer restoration. And can this be the reason why we're having a difference in effect of what that uh, the soft tissue appearance is? And we're going to discuss this in depth a little later on. I had another patient who came to my office. This is an 80-year-old woman. Uh, she comes to my office in november and she says to me well my crown fractured off my tooth um i've had an implant before see yeah you haven't done it but someone did it and i look at it, it looks fairly nice and she says i'd like to have an implant to replace this tooth and it's a cuspid okay so i think okay um you know cuspids we're relatively wary of and it's not just as they're adequate bone to stabilize the implant but what is the what is the uh the of the of the management of the functional and excursive and protrusive movements of that patient, because even if I can relieve them completely in a cuspid, if the patient has somewhat of a deep bite, they're still going to be able to put pressure on that, and I potentially have a failing implant. And so um, this patient had a favorable occlusal relationship, and we said, okay, we can take out that tooth and replace an implant. And I'm thinking, okay, I'll take the crown off of this implant, it's screw retained, and can't leave her off a provisional tooth. Um, and she says, no, I really don't want you to touch this implant. I don't want to wear something removable. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to Florida for the winter in one week from now. So, okay, I can't make her something removable. I'm not going to make her a transitional partial denture. I can't use this implant. Um, I'm not going to take the restoration of this tooth because this is the next tooth that's going to be lost for this, this patient. And so the decision is because it's a favorable relationship to do an, an immediate implant. So she comes back in. I extract the tooth. I place the implant. This is going to pop up the uh, advanced implant and immediately provisionalize the case. And she goes off to Florida. Now, I, before she goes to Florida, I give her all our instructions, as we normally do, that she should not be eating on that tooth. She should be favoring the other side of her mouth. And even with that, she should be on a softer diet, even though you know, she's not going to be chewing on that tooth. But I know very well that this 80-year-old woman who's going down to Florida, right, she's waking up in the morning. She's going to play mahjong with her friends. She's having lunch with different friends. And the last thing she's thinking about is that implant. Right. It's just not part of her life. Not at this point that, you know, at 80 years old, she's going to go ahead and enjoy her, her social life. Um, and I'm hoping that I've put enough measures in place. Right. And, and placed a large enough implant with adequate bone stability, managing the provisional restoration and its occlusion that it'll tolerate whatever she's going to do. Now she comes back actually seven months later. And I take an X-ray and I'm prepared you know, I'm, I'm expecting the implant to have healed. I'm prepared to have maybe even a little bit of crestal bone loss around this implant because I know this patient has probably abused this implant and she's not thinking about it. She's comfortable in it. She's, she's, you know, she's going on with her daily life. 
and I take the x-ray and this is what I see. And I say, wow, that looks pretty nice. Not only don't I have any crestal bone loss, right? But bone looks really good. Let, let me take a closer look at it. So here it is on the day of extraction, you know, and so the extraction and medium implant placement, and you see I can have some space here. Here's the provisional component and here's the platform switch. And here I see the bone coming up just on, up underneath the platform switch on the other on the other side. And now I look at my x-ray when she comes back in at seven months and I see, wow, the bone looks like it's completely filled in, you know, in that space and up over the platform switch and creeping over the platform switch on the other side. I say, how, oh, hey, is there, you know, there's something else going on here. So I'm getting a result that I didn't maybe expect. And I said, let me go back and look at other patients of mine. Now, routinely, we place implants and before they restored, we go and obviously we take x-rays and evaluate them. But there's a difference at looking at these x-rays and really examining these x-rays. I said, yeah, let me go back and look at them very critically. So I started looking at x-rays critically, not from the point of time when the implant was placed when we're ready to restore it, but I said, let me look at it from when the implant has been restored, initial restoration is inserted, but some point later on in time. So this is the day you can see your custom abutments have been placed on this implant. And if we look at this, we can see, okay, we have a, a little bit of space, you know, a bone is pretty much up to the platform switch with a little switch, a little space. And over here, maybe even, you know, the bone broke down just on the platform switch, uh, the same thing on this implant, and maybe even a little bone loss over here. And now I look almost two and a half years later after the implant's been restored, and I say, wow, look at the bone. The bone now has consolidated up to the platform switch over here and on the same side of the other one. Again, comparing it to where I was here when it was initial restoration was placed, the bone appears to be, might be over the platform switch here. And this distal of this implant over here where I thought maybe there was some bone lost, I, it appears that I have bone that's come all the way up to maybe just over the platform switch. Now, now, do I believe I grew bone vertically over that period of time? You know, I don't know that I can say that, but I think the bones matured. The bone was in initially in a remodeling process and the bone matured in a positive manner. Let's look at another patient. Here it is. This is a patient had been a, a, an implant placed and a generally missing tooth with immediate provisionalization. And I look at it again, two, two and a quarter years or so after restoration, okay, not from the time of replacement, from the time of restoration, and the same thing. Again, you know, what was going on with the bone here? Was it in a, like a hypomineralized state in a remodeling process? And here the bones all condensed and become healthy. I think that's probably likely what's going on in these cases. Um, but, you know, that's something interesting because, what, you know, when we go back to what we were originally, originally taught uh, by Brandemark, where our expectation was that we would have a millimeter of bone loss in the first year, and then, oh, maybe two-tenths of a millimeter of bone loss after that, each year after that, in a healthy implant. I'm sure things have changed, you know, in the era of platform switching and, and all surfaces, possibly, but here I'm seeing bone improvement. Something's changed in the nature of biology of what's going on at the interface and the, from the bone to the implant. So that in through this remodeling process, the bone isn't running away. In the remodeling process, bone is maturing and condensing against the implant. So I said, let me go ahead and do a little bit more of a study on this. And I went and I did and uh, I did a study and then wrote a paper that was published uh, just last month in April 2020 in Compendium. It was a, this has been peer reviewed. And I wrote this article along with Dennis Tarnow and Lauren Lairfield. And this was my was my study. The study was to go ahead and to retrospectively evaluate changes in bone following final abutment insertion and functional loading. And we wanted to evaluate many factors relative to it. it had to do with the implant type, the width of the implant, the length, whether it was put into healed bone, extraction sockets, immediate provisionalization, the type of abutments, screw retained, cemented, splinted, and follow those implants over time, but from the time of restoration and see what happened with the, with the bone type of implant were, were of the pal top type, and the overall design is with a self-typey thread, paper design and on the apical third, the midsection of the implant, well, the implant section is somewhat, is somewhat straight, is somewhat straight, um, and then we have micro threads, micro threads at the top of the implant with an ultra pure SLA surface treatment and platform switching. So that's the the implant, uh, let's call it geometric and surface design.
Now, what, what I looked at was 50 consecutive patients. So I didn't pick and choose patients, but 50 consecutive patients that fit the criteria of 87 implants. And they were followed radiographically, it was not with a standardized radiographic format because it was a retrospective study, but qualification, qualification criteria, okay, to include it, that we would be able to say reasonably, okay, that we weren't having a lot of elongation or foreshortening of the implant. But because of that, measurements weren't taken. I looked for a trend or direction of the, of the implant. And even having said, okay, it's not standardized, I would expect to see things decreasing as well as increasing on the same variation, you know, on that, uh, for that uh, format because of uh, qualification criteria. And so we looked again at 50 consecutive patients, 87 implants for a period of maybe one year to four years following restoration of the, of the implants. And here was the, the things that we looked at. We looked at the at uh, at the implants. We compared every category to a control group of a different company, but a similar type of design and surface treatment implant. We looked at bone status by gender. We looked at bone status by implant placement into extraction socket versus healed bone versus healed bone with the previous bone graft. We looked at uh, uh, immediate healing versus immediate temporary versus implants that were buried whether the procedures were done flap or flapless. We looked at implant diameters. We looked at implant lengths. We looked at whether the restoration was cementable or screw retained. We looked at whether it was a single unit or splinted restorations. Type of abutment, were they custom abutments, multi-unit, multi-units, were they UCLA design, tie-based. We looked at the time span between the final abutment insertion and the follow-up x-ray, as well as number of implants within each one of those time spans. Now, I will tell you that um, we statistically, we didn't have enough implants when you start to breaking everything up into categories, but I encourage you to read the article and look at the article because the data is very interesting in what it's, in what it's alluding to, okay, what it's alluding to. And certainly we need to verify all of this in, a, in the larger controlled prospective study. But we were able to go ahead and look at a trend of the of the implants of whole. And what we found was this, 30% of the implant surfaces showed bone improvement. Yeah, let me say that again. 30% of the implants showed bone improvement, what appeared to be improvement, like I showed you those in, the, in those initial x-rays following restoration. So from restoration to one to four years later, 62% of the implant surfaces showed bone maintenance. And 8% showed bone decrease, okay, but that de over the time. But that decrease was 0.1 to 1 millimeter. So over the time, so still well within the range, even of the, of the original Brandenburg criteria. So talking about that time, you know, having 1 millimeter, you know, total, uh, absolute of 1 millimeter, most of the time, you know, significantly less. So we're talking about 92% of the time, the bone being at least maintained, with 30% of the time, bone looking better over time. Better over time, not two tenths of a millimeter, you know, bone loss, you know, in, in terms of uh, that, you know. Over time. The question is, is, is why are we seeing this, and why am I seeing this? Because I can, I, I, I compare this to a con control group. My patients again, where I went ahead and used the same exact criteria, okay, with the, you know, for all the different categories, and I didn't see the same thing in terms of that. So I hypothesize that it comes down to three different areas. One having to do with an ultra high purity SLA surface treatment. The second has to do with what I would call a, a concave design in the transgingival segment, so from the implant connection to the frigidal margin. And the third having to do with uh, precision tolerances that we all recognize help prevent micro movement. And what do all those things lead to? A reduction in inflammation. If we have a reduction in inflammation at that implant to abutment interface at that point in time, um, we will have less bone remodeling, less activity at that point, and therefore we can maintain bone and perhaps let the biology of the patient do what it wants to go ahead and do, and that's remodel the bone to repair the bone. And the implant just happens to be there in the way and gains the benefit of that bone condensing and remodeling in a positive fashion up against that. So let's look at each one of these areas. So first, first, uh, first uh, category, SLA treatment. So we're all familiar with SLA treatment, originally originated by uh, by Strauman, sand grafting, sand grafting, large grit and acid uh, 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 etching. Um, 
And most implant companies that offer an altered surface today use a form of SLA treatment. You know, you know, but it is all SLA the same, right? Now, we all use the same basic recipe, and here it is. For those of you that are, are a little bored, have some spare time, and you might be thinking, well, you know, why don't I go ahead and machine some implants in my garage in my spare time before I get to my patients? Here's the recipe, okay? So number one, you take your rod of titanium, you put it into your, your uh, star milling machine, and you mill out the implant. And when you machine the implant, right, it generates heat, so it needs to be cooled. Uh, and so what's the coolant? Well, you know, we use coolant when we, you know, saline when we drill into bone. These machines use oil, okay, use oil. So first the machine, the machine, you know, creates the implant, and then we need to degrease and remove all the oil from the implant. After the oil is removed from the implant and the implant is cleaned, we create the macro roughness by sandblasting it with aluminum oxide particles those particles are cleaned off and then the implant has its initial uh, passivation with nitric acid you clean that off and then you create micro pitting with the acid phosphoric acid uh etching and then that's cleaned off that's the rest of basic recipe for sla now we uh we we there was an article that was published several years ago of a study that was done at the university of cologne by professor dirk dudek where he went and he looked at 120 different implants. He took 120 implants from 120 different companies, and he looked uh, under a scanning electron microscope at the surface of the implants, and he found that on many of the implants, there were surface impurities, a lot of surface impurity on these, on these implants. Um, several were cleaner or purer than the other one. And one of the purest ones was the Paltop brand. So how did that happen that it has a cleaner or purer surface? I just told you most of us use the same similar surface treatment process. So when the surface treatment process was, was developed for Paltop, it was done by its founder, a man by the name of Sam Topaz. And Topaz came from the, the micro uh, uh, processor semiconductor industry. Uh, where we manufactured parts and pieces for the semiconductor industry. And so in that arena, you have to be somewhat of an expert in surface treatment and surface purity because the order of magnitude of cleanliness or purity of the surface has to be so much greater than what we have uh, in implant dentistry or in medicine in general. That's crazy, right? You know, if we use the level of surface purity that exists in medicine today for the semiconductors that we put inside, okay, these, uh, these things that we put inside our cell phones and inside our computers, none of them would work. None of them would work. But he said, listen, I understand surface you know, purity and it's pure important. And so if it makes sense in a cell phone, in the human body, of course, we need to strive for that. So, you know, when you, when you bake a cake, if you have 10 people who take the same exact recipe, the cake is going to come out a little different from each person. And that's the that's what happens with you know the SLA recipe. So he developed his recipe for that, and because an understanding that of surface purity, he said, "I'm going to do something called XPS analysis." That's the same analysis that Professor Dirk Dudek used in his uh, in his study at the University of Cologne. And so what that does is you look on from an elemental basis what's on the surface of the implant. So he would go and he would employ his SLA recipe. And then he would analyze the surface and see, is there surface impurity on that surface? And he kept on revising and revising the process and how he implemented that recipe until he came out with this. Take a look here. What we find on the surface is carbon, titanium, oxygen, aluminum, vanadium. Why do we see uh, aluminum and vanadium? Because it's grade five titanium, titanium alloy and nitrogen, but nothing else. So what you would expect from Titanium alloy, that's what's on the surface and nothing and nothing else. And yet when you look and study other major implant brands, other major implant brands, and, and look in the Professor Dirk Dudek study, you'll find that there are other things. Take a look at this implant. This one has carbon, titanium, and oxygen. So this is CP titanium, commercially pure titanium, okay? But that has nothing to do with what happens afterwards because you'll look and you'll see that what's on there Zinc, Zn, zinc. Well, why is there zinc on the surface of this implant? Well, when you do the surface treatment and then you clean the surface treatment off, you clean the acids, you clean the oxide, what do you clean it with? 
water. What's inside water? Zinc. Take a look at this different implant brand. There's phosphorus, sulfur, zinc, chlorine, potassium, silicon. What are all these from? These are from the surface processing, from the etchants, from the, from the, from the blasting with aluminum oxide. These are things that are left behind on the surface of the implant. So you'll say, okay, so what? You know, my implant brand says that we can, we're going to have a 97% success rate. When I place my implants in, they integrate. I rarely have a failure. So I do have a 97% success rate. So what difference does it make if there's some surface impurity on the, on the, on the implant? So there was an article that was published in a, a journal called Frontiers, uh, Frontiers, I think, in Immunology. Um, and it was a study, it was an article published by, from the Department of Periodontology at uh, Hebrew University. And this is what it was called. It was called Impaired Differentiation of Langerhans Cells in the Murine Oral Epithelium Adjacent Titanium Dental Implants. Wow. Um, you know what I do when I open up a journal and I see that title? I turn the page and go to the next article. You know, I'm not reading this article. Um, what does this got to do with things that I do every day? Well, this has a lot to do with that. Oh, what happened was in the Department of Periodontology, they said, listen, we know that uh, there's a lot more periimplantitis that exists than we'd like to admit. We know that in studies, they're talking about 25 to 40 percent of implants or more developing periimplantitis. And so therefore, we'd like to study it and we need to study it. We want to make an animal model to study it so that we can better address it. And they said, well, what, what's a good model? Mice. Mice. Let's use mice. So they went ahead and had some mice-sized implants made. They placed the implants to the, to the mice, allowed them to heal. And then they sacrificed and took sections of the, of these, uh, of the bone and soft tissue with the implants. Now, inside the gingiva, okay, we know that uh, in our patients, there's something called Langerhans cells. This is very well established in the periodontal literature. And what these Langerhans cells do is they provide the uh, immune response, the antibody response to normal bacteria that are inside patients' mouths. So the Langerhans cells provide an immune response to this. And what they found in the studies that was that when they analyzed the soft tissues around the implant, and they went looking for these Langerhans cells, what they found was that the precursor cells, the Langerhans cells, were there in normal amounts. But the Langerhans cells themselves were significantly reduced. So the precursor cell from the Langerhans cell was there. But the Langerhans cell, the cell that actually provides the antibody response or the immune response, was significantly reduced in that, uh, in that area. Wow, if this significantly reduced, what does that mean? That means the patient's body can't provide the immune response that's necessary to combat, to combat bacteria. Well, maybe that has something to do with uh, why periplantitis develops over time. Because the body can't fight off the bacteria properly. They said, well, why, why is that? You know, why don't, aren't we seeing Langerhans cells in the, in the appropriate amounts or what we're used to going ahead and seeing? So they theorized this. You know, we know also from literature that titanium ions are released from the implants. And they theorized that these, this titanium ion release resulted, right, in the, the uh, inability of the, of the precursor cells to, to differentiate into proper Langerhans cells. So ion release, okay, ion release was now preventing, preventing the proper formation of the immune response that uh, patients normally have, right, to bacteria inside their, inside their mouth. So what does that have to do with surface impurity? You know, why am I bringing that, that up here? Well, why do we use titanium or titanium alloy to go ahead and, and place our, our, or for our implants? So we use that because it forms a strong oxide layer, which means that the chemical bonds on the surface of the implant are strong. It holds everything intact. So if I take a nail, it's made out of iron, and I throw it into a glass of water, what's going to happen? It's going to rust. What's rust? Oxidation. What's oxidation? Well, it's ions being released off the surface of the implant. The chemical bonds on the surface of that iron nail are not strong. So lots of ions are being released, producing this process that we call oxidation and or, and or rust. So now if we go back to our impurities, right, that we're having on the surface of the implant, what kind of impact can they have? Well, we know that if you put impurities on a surface, 
it will create holes in the oxide layer. And if there are holes in the oxide layer, then perhaps more titanium ions are being released. We're using the titanium because it has a strong oxide layer. But if the oxide layer is not complete because there are impurities on that layer, right, then we're going to have more ions potentially released into that environment. If we have more ions released, what's going, what are those ions going to do? Um, if the researchers at the university are correct, they're going to impair the Langer precursor Langerhan cells from turning into into Langerhans cells, which impairs the body's immune response over time, over time. So the impact now of having impurities versus no impurities is that that surface treatment, right, may have an impact on long-term bone maintenance. Because remember, the initial integration comes because the geometric shape creates, you know, stability and prevents micro movement of that implant. But the long-term stability at that at that uh, at that bone implant interface can be affected because impurities on the surface of that implant are creating more ion release, which prevents the body's immune response to uh, to predictably and effectively happening. Okay, well, first area. Second, we talked about having a concave transgingival design, like I showed you in that first case that I showed you, where the soft tissue appeared to be better around one implant restoration than the other. Well, again, we have that concave design here. I've shown you that same restoration from that case and the full line of concave components that go along with that. And so, you know, it was, uh, we talk about, uh, you know, concave design, and there are many companies today that are going and providing uh, equipment with this concave design. And the theory or the concept is that, uh, you know, will increase the or maximize the volume of soft tissue and maximize the vascularity in that area by not crowding that area and therefore have better soft tissue. But there was an article that was published back in 2018 in Clinical Oral Implant Research that actually provides some data to support why a concave design might be better. So in this article, what they did is they went ahead and they compared and they looked at what at the implant abutment interface and the trajectory of the abutment as it comes off it and what impact it may have. And they compared a wide and more divergent you know, uh, profile versus a narrower profile. And what they found was that when you had that wide, more divergent profile, in an attempt to reestablish the peri-implant biologic width, you had more bone remodeling, creating bone loss around the, around the implant. So this article was suggesting that by having something narrower around the implant as it you know, transcends out of or, or you know, extends out of the implant, you want to have something narrower that will allow a peri-implant biologic width to be established without having to cause bone loss around the, around the implant. So let's go back to our initial patient, right? And there you see her provisional in place, and that's the position of the implant relative to the provisional restoration. And we see that we have to transcend out to the provisional, right? So we go from the, the connection to where we want the emergence profile to be. Now, I'm a prosthodontist by training, and this is what I was taught. I need to go ahead and I need to support the soft tissue, right? I need to go ahead and support the soft tissue by design. So I transcend out or come out of the connection, and I flare that abutment out, right? Support the soft tissue to come to the proper emergence profile. And that's what you saw in, in, the, in the restoration that we saw from there. It, we go from the connection and we're flaring out to the proper emergence profile. But if we go back to the literature, which suggests that going ahead and having this, uh, this more divergent and acute angle, right, may create more bone remodeling and therefore more, more of an inflammatory response around that, around that soft tissue, right? So it's advocating against this, having something that's narrower. So how do we go? How do we get from connection, right, being narrow to prevent that uh, remodeling in a negative fashion around the connection to a proper emergence profile as it comes out of the soft tissue? How do we do that? Well, the answer is simple. It's with a concave design because when we come up off the connection and now we create more space for that to that soft tissue and more space for that biologic width to be developed, and then we transcend out or then we go out to what our proper emergence profile is going to be. And that's where the concave design comes in. And this is what I believe supports that concept of concave design. And many of us are already going ahead and utilizing it, but we have now some data to support that what we're doing is the, is the, proper, is the proper thing. And so going and we're moving from 
the design of flaring out from the connection supporting the soft tissue to having a narrower design, right? Then flaring out only as we as we come to and exit out the the free digital margin position. So we have a good emergence profile in that position. And in this manner, we end up with maximum healthy soft tissue. And, you know, and, and, and what we want and what we have around the implant are healthy circular gingival fiber, fibers minus, right, it, uh, the whole inflammatory response. And with hemidesmosomal attachment, that's going to be healthy and strong because they're being compressed, right, uh, from the very healthy circular gingival fibers. And this is what we predictably want to go ahead and see. Again, all that leading to a reduction in inflammation again. And then lastly, the third factor we wanted to talk about was the close tolerances, okay, and precise machining. And this we know very well for many years already on the literature. Uh, we want to prevent any micro movement at the implant to abutment connection because that will only create bacterial micro leakage if we have movement, and therefore we'll have bacteria and its resultant endotoxins, again, creating inflammation. All of these things creating inflammation, we want to prevent that. So with this system, we have very precise tolerances that have no micro movement in that, in that arena. And so therefore we take the, I'll just show you this one patient here, uh, two teeth are going to be extracted and implant is being placed. This is a pal top uh, pie implant, a little more aggressive designed where, where it has actually a, a machine, not polished, a machine collar. And here's the day of implant placement. And you can see now this is after, I believe, uh, four months or so of healing in these extraction sockets. You can see that routinely we have healthy bone that's grown over the implant, okay? Because it likes the surface of the implant. Even the machine surface, it likes that. We have to actually remove bone over the head of the implant. And you see this healthy, vital, bleeding bone over the, over the implant. So this surface is not only tolerated, it's really liked, it, it encourages bone growth around over it. And in this patient who hasn't maintained the best oral hygiene, look at the plaque that's there, doesn't have the best oral hygiene around that. And yet you can see, you know, the healthy soft tissue that we have because of these concepts being followed. The concave design coming off the surface of the implant, along with the ultra pure surface of the, of the implant and the precise fitting of the, of the abutments to the, to the implants. Just two quick cases that uh, will, uh, you know, exhibit to demonstrate the things relative to bone and soft tissue. So I treat many patients congenitally missing teeth. Here's a, a young girl missing uh, two mandibular anterior teeth. Difficult case. Why? Even though it's in the anterior, difficult case because number one, right, we have two adjacent teeth and create, uh, you know, a nice parabolic architecture and soft tissue form and two adjacent teeth, so you can't differentiate it between it and its adjacent teeth is difficult. The patient is 18 years old, and her mother is looking over your shoulder. So we want to try and get, create predictability, and we can do that by going, at least in my hands, by having my, you know, uh, uh, an excellent orthodontist, Dr. Joey Oppenheimer. He's uh, unfortunately passed away, um, and he's gone and he's taken the two lateral incisors by my instruction and moved them into central incisor positions. And now I've taken a relatively complex case and made it relatively predictable because in single tooth sites where I have adjacent interceptal bone at the proper position to support papilla, I can very predictably create you know, very aesthetic restorations. And so we go through our normal protocol, take our comb beam CT, integrate it with our uh, intraoral surface scanning, have a virtual wax up created and create our whole plan for implant placement. We use our evidence-based numbers in generally missing cases. Almost always, almost always, the bone is, you have too much bone in a coronal position. If you place the implant at the level of the bone, you're going to have an unesthetic restoration because the, the bone is level with the most coronal portion of the adjacent interceptal bone. So this is good for us because we want to place the implant subprestally, leave the bone, though, however, that supports the adjacent teeth on either side to support the papilla. So we use our evidence-based measurements to go ahead and do this. We don't have to be measuring at the time of surgery. It's all done pre-surgically. Because that's surgical guide. Scanning is very precise, so we don't even need to remove the orthodontic wires. We go in there are sites here, a Paltop uh, 3.25 narrow platform implant by 13 millimeter implant is going to be placed. And it's placed precisely, precisely in position according to the plan. And we leave the adjacent interceptal bone in position. So I carve out the parabolic architecture here, right? 
you know, uh, around on the mid buckle, but I leave the bone on either on either side. Now we harvest some connective tissue from the palate and graft out the buccal concavity. So there wasn't a the concavity didn't impact the the bony segment, but aesthetically impacted areas. Uh, and then we, we take provisionals, immediate provisionals. They're tie based, put in the appropriate contours, right, and suture the patient closed. Here's the patient now. Oh, four months later, we have nice, healthy soft tissue, an overabundance of soft tissue, which is good. So we can go and we can carve out here. I've done just with a diode soft tissue laser, buy out the free gingival margin position. And then the case can be, can be, you know, restorations can be finished. And we very predictably, very predictably can go and can take a patient, right, from a complex situation and predictably meet the expectate demands and reasonable expectations from both the patient and her and her mother. Because again, we're dealing with a young patient. And you can see that, you know, using these systems and these in these concepts, we maintain good bone levels and we have excellent uh, an excellent soft tissue profile when we start. One more patient, okay. Again, another congenitally missing patient. So I'm not showing you simple patients, but more complex patients that required uh, management of both soft tissue and bone. This patient was also missing, generally missing two anterior teeth. The orthodontist closed the space down, okay, and left a one-tooth space. Uh, in doing that, lost the labial or buccal bone on the uh, tooth number 25, um, creating a mucogingival defect. And so we need to manage both. We need to manage both the missing tooth as well as the mucogingival defect on the adjacent tooth. Now, it appears that there's plenty of bone in this area, and usually there's adequate bone to place the implant, but not in this patient. The bone was very narrow, although we had adequate spacing between the roots of the adjacent teeth and adequate vertical height of bone. Take a look. If we place the implant in position, look how much of that bone is going to be uh, or how significant fenestration is going to be of that implant, more than half of it out of the out of the bone. And if we place that implant into the correct position, you know, it's only where you see that dotted line that there would actually be adequate bone to position the implant. We're certainly not going to place it in that apical position. So there are many different ways to go ahead and, and manage the bone. In this case, my, my choice was just to go and harvest monocortical cortical blocks of bone, apical to that very same area, move them coronally in that area, right, to graft that bone. And uh, other people might use PPR, other type of techniques to go ahead and, and manage the situation. This was my particular choice in this area. Go ahead and take the bone from the apical site, donor site, and the same site as the recipient site. So there you can see I've taken uh, uh, cores of bone. It was easy using a Meisinger kit. Move them more coronally and it do a, uh, a laterally positioned uh, a perianal flap. Go and to cover the mucogingival defect on the adjacent uh, central incisor in that area. And there you see what the what the area looks like on the on the radiograph. We come back after four months. We see we have nice soft tissue. We have, uh, I think, a reasonable correction to the mucogingival defect and good bony healing of the of the site. A new CT scan is taken. Planning is done, and you can see now what the planning is relative to where we had started, right? So that we have now got adequate bone to go ahead and place the implant versus before, right? An implant that um, that uh, half of it was going to be out of out of bone. We take our intral surface scan. We combine it with our comb beam plan, right? And we're ready for surgery. We open the tissue, uh, remove the, the screws retaining the block, place our surgical guide, and position our implant. Again, this is going to be a narrow platform, 3.25 millimeter diameter pal top implant. And here you just see the the uh, implant body try-in. I always use the implant body try-in, even though I've gone ahead and created a surgical guide so that I can see, make sure exactly what the correct vertical position is and verify where that is relative to my plan prior to placing my implant. There you can see the correct the implant in the correct position, and you can see it's well below the bone, okay? Well, not because of the, I needed that with the bone at that position, but that's where I needed the, the head of the implant to be to get an aesthetic restoration. And it's created just by nature its own parabolic architecture where I'm going to support the adjacent papilla in that area. So here's my implant. We take our ISQ measurement. Again, we always uh, evaluate stability at that point and again at the time of restoration. And again, you see the nice architecture and shape I have for the, for the bone to support the soft tissue. We do some more connective tissue grafting in a case like this. 
Now, a little soft tissue is good, more is, uh, is better. So I'm trying to build the bulk of soft tissue. We allow that to here approximately another three months. And at three months here, you see a nice volume of soft tissue, right? We have um, and good healing of the implant itself. Now, I don't want to go ahead and manipulate the soft tissue again, so it's more of a punch technique. I've taken my peak vision restoration, created some mechanical retention, created a more of a concave design, again, to try and maximize the amount of soft tissue that I can have in that area, placed it, allowed the area to mature, and then create a tie-based tie -based restoration. So this is a monolithic zirconia that's layered with porcelain on a, on a tie base. And then we finish the, finish the case. And yeah, we have good bone healing. We have excellent soft tissue healing. Again, the patient has a little bit of a dry mouth. And so maybe with a little bit of better oral hygiene, you could get rid of the redness in this, in this soft tissue. But I think from where we started at this point, to be able to come to a point like this, um, I'm pretty happy. The patient's pretty happy. The mother's pretty happy. We're maintaining our bone volume. So we have good bony support, a good position. We have healthy soft tissue. And those are the things that we need for long-term viability of our, of our implant. So why do I think we can go ahead and obtain these results? Why do I choose to utilize these uh, types of products? I attributed to three things, and these are things that you should think about in, in the materials that you use. We, we want to go ahead and minimize the inflammation or the potential for the inflammatory process around the, that junction between the implant and the abutment. And here, and I attribute it to, uh, number one, ultra-high purity SLA surface treatment and what the implications are of that relative to surface impurities or lack of surface impurities and how that improves the patient's ability to fight off bacteria and the resultant, you know, bacterial endotoxins that, that come from that, from that bacteria. One, having a concave design, which I think improves the mechanical defenses of the patient by having a better gingival structure or tighter or healthier attachment around that implant, by having healthy, tight, circular gingival fibers, and therefore they're compressing and holding on those hemidesmosomes, potentially preventing, again, penetration of bacteria, and by having uh, a very uh, tight tolerances between components, between the implants and the abutments, preventing any micro leakage from the component from the at the level of the of the interface in that, in that area. I'd like to thank you for your time. About an hour, maybe a couple of minutes over. Where I thought I was going to be. Um, I can be reached for questions. We're going to answer questions right now, uh, right now live. Uh, but if you have questions that you'd like or things you'd like to ask me later on, not live, I can be reached at m.klein at paltopdental.com. Um, thank you for your time and attention. I hope I provided you with something to think about, maybe a little bit different, okay, than we're ordinarily used to looking at things. But um, but this is where, you know, as 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 Clinical practitioners, this is how we have to think, not just about the mechanics of what we do, but about the science and biology of what we do. And it's much more complex than we normally like to think about it. So I'm happy to answer any questions now. Thank you.